ओम ज्ञान तिमिरंधस्य ज्ञानं जनश्रमाकाय चक्षुर नीलितम् येन तस्मै श्री गुरुवे नमः यू आर ऑल फ्रॉम इंडिया एनीवन फ्रॉम बांग्लादेश सो दे आर ऑल इन द अदर ग्रुप कोनो बंगाली आई कैन ऐड सेम नी नो बंगालीज श्रीलंकन्स नेपालीज पाकिस्तानीज सब शुद्ध भारतीय है हरि बोल हरि बोल तो आज का उजाड़ भारतीय बहुत ही अशुद्ध है उनके व्यवहार बहुत अशुद्ध है लेकिन श्री प्रभात की कृपा से ये पुण्य भूमि जो अभी आज का पाप भूमि बन गया है तो फिर पुण्यवती भूमि बन सकती है I should speak in English, sir. Huh? Is it mostly South Indians or what is it? English. English speak. Could could we turn the uh, fan down or off because my voice is already. I can see. I'm looking at the pictures of Sri Sri Gorantai, Sri Sri Krishna Balaram, Sri Sri Radha Sham Sundar, and the. Underneath is written International Society for Krishna Conscious Founder Acharya. It's Ram Gaye Sesi Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabha Shri Krishna Balaram Mandir Bhakti Vedanta Swami Marg Raman Reti Vindavan UP and I can't read the number it's too small. <laughs> so this is the address of Krishna Balaram Mandir. Yeah. Yeah, and it's the address of this place also, but no, it's not the address. <laughs> but if you send a letter, say from London to this address, which I just read, it will reach there. It won't reach here. It'll be in scientific. So, the Darwin is in UK. Formerly in the British town, UP meant United Provinces, <laughs> more or less the same area. Now it's Uttar Pradesh. So Vrindavan is in UP. No, it's not really in, for for the sake of well, it's a material necessity to say to say that for well, Vrindavan, it's in Mathura district. It's in UP, which is part of India. But actually, Vrindavan is not in this material world at all. That's why Narottamda says, "Vishoy chaya kavi shudha hove man kavi hama hera bo shri Vrindavan." When I become free from the desire for sense gratification and my mind becomes purified, then I can see Vrindavan. So our Krishna conscious movement is meant for going to Vrindavan. Sri Lanka writes in one purport in the songbook that this Krishna conscious movement is meant for joining the Rasadams of Krishna. You'll find throughout Sri Lanka books he mentions in various places what is the he says this Krishna conscious movement is meant for or the purpose of this Krishna conscious movement. Many times, maybe more than a hundred times, and he gives different reasons to to give information to the conditioned souls of the of their true life. Or he's, in one place, he says our our mission is to glorify Jiva Goswami. This Krishna conscious movement is founded in pursuance of the order of Sri Bhakti Siddhanta Sarkar. But in this one purport, specifically, which I'm talking about. He says that uh, this is this is specially meant for entering into the rasa dance of Krishna. It's meant for going to Vrindavan. We're all meant to go to Vrindavan. So they think, well, that's not very difficult. Thing. If you're in Kuwait, you have to take a flight to Delhi, and then you can take a taxi or go by bus or train or. <coughs> to Mathura, or you get a direct bus to Vrindavan. But Narottam Das, 
He has given us the real form of the Tivam Tivanta Vrindavan. Narottam Das, as a young boy, <coughs> this is his worldly history. Here. Now, we're, what we're doing here, we're comparing the worldly impression with the true spiritual essence. So, from the worldly point of view, Vrindavan is part of India. But the true spiritual essence of Vrindavan has got nothing to do with any place of this world. So similarly, when we're talking about Naroda, we say that he was a prince. It means his father was king, not, not a very big king, a local king. Because there were many Maharajas in India who were, they'd be the Maharaj of, you know, five villages or something like this. So anyway, his father was a Bhumida, king of a local area. So he was born into wealthy circumstances, but as a young man, he left home and went to Vrindavan. Now, how did he go to Vrindavan? Well, he was born in Keturi, which is close to the bank of the river Padma, presently in Bangladesh. Now the Padma, if you look on the map, you'll see the Ganga flows down from Gomuk to Gangotri and then down to Haridwar and so many places comes down. There's so many famous holy places that you can't get on the camp or a little removed from the Holy Spirit. And then Varanasi. Hatna, Hatna, Hatna. Where the Faraka barrage is now, actually if you see the Ganga appears to go straight into East Bengal. But the actual part of the Ganga is the Bhagirathi, which comes down through West Bengal. That's the path that Bhagirat Maharaj took to Ganga was to Ganga Sagar. And the main flow of the water, if the Faraka barrage wasn't there, that is not <coughs> called the Ganga anymore, that's called Padma. It's considered a different river from the Ganga, and the actual river is considered the Bhagira. Bhagira Ganga. So anyway, Narottam Das was born on the bank of the Padma. So to go to Vrindavan, how did he go? Which train did he take? No train. He had to walk along the bank of the Padma and along the bank of the Ganga to Prayag, and then follow the path of the Yamuna. This was the path from Bengal <coughs> to Vrindavan, which many, many people took. Because uh, by the influence of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Vrindavan became uh, the main or uh, place of pilgrimage for the Gauri of Aishan, so mostly in Bengal. So many people they would walk along the path of the Yamuna, the Ganga and the Yamuna and come to Vrindavan. So Narottam Das went there with much more difficulty than most people would consider taking in the present day. Nowadays, if one is to go from Bengal, to mostly one will go by train to Delhi, or you can take a direct train from Tower to Mathura, but it's very slow, so most people don't take that train. And they think, oh, very long train ride, very troublesome. <coughs> it takes a whole day in hot and heat and dust. And, but then, you know, if you have to walk for several months, that's a much more difficult proposition, isn't it? Nowadays, mostly we wouldn't do that. But that's going on pilgrimage used to mean that. It wasn't, now it's all bus pilgrimage mostly. You can get uh, to Vaishnav Devi, you can go by helicopter. Place of Deca Airways. Say, otherwise, you know, it takes you five minutes to go by helicopter, otherwise, several hours of difficult traversing over the rocks and the ice. And so, Narottam Das went with great difficulty. He left home and he ran like a madman to Vrindavan, hardly eating or sleeping. There's no arrangement for food, but anyway, people would give something along the way. 
But he says that even despite taking so much austerity to go to Vrindavan, that in and of itself does not grant us entrance. So what to speak of the modern age where we come in, you know, in an air-conditioned taxi and I'm not saying it's wrong to go in an air-conditioned taxi, but we should try to understand the mood of Narottam Das, who taught us that Bishoy Chariya Kobe Shuddha Habe Mon Tabe Hame Herabo Shri Vrindava. That when our mind is, when we're completely free from the desire for sense gratification, and our mind is purified, then we can actually see Vrindava. So this is the aim of the devotees, to go to Vrindavan. Why to go to Vrindavan? Because there we will see Radha and Krishna. Is that why we want to go to Vrindavan? No. We should go to serve Radha and Krishna. Because that is their place of where they perform their pastimes. And we are servants, so it's not... We are not... Many people say you want to see God. What do you think He is? Some kind of, some kind of theater? You go and you see Him? No, we have to go and serve him. Srila Prabhupada once was saying that the devote once he was saying that the devotees they only want Krishna. And then Srila Prabhupada took it a step further and said that they don't even want Krishna, they only want to serve Krishna. So with this attitude of service we can actually enter Vrindavan. And people who don't have this attitude they can never go to Vrindavan. People who think that Vrindavan is part of this material world. I bought a plot of land in Vrindavan as an investment because the prices are going up all the time. So I bought this land and you know, in five years I will make five times my money. So it's a good investment. This is not the way to understand Vrindavan. Once one, uh, one young man, a doctor, he approached Gorky Shodas Babaji Maharaj and said that I, I purchased some land in Navadvip Dham and I want to, I'll, I'll, make my, I'll do my doctor's practice there and serve the Dham Vasis. And Gorky Shodas Babaji Maharaj became very angry. He said, what do you, what do you mean you, you purchased a plot of land in the dham? He said, all the money in all the world is not enough to... You, you can't buy even one speck of dust from Navadri dham. You, can, you, don't, you, don't, you cannot own the dham. If you think this is my plot of land in the dham. Of course, for... Practical, what we might call practical purposes. I mean, even Srila Prabhupada was, he got land donated in the dham. His attitude was completely one of service. So that is the essence of Krishna consciousness. To serve Krishna for his pleasure only. That's all. It's not like a conventional religion. People say, what is your religion? When Srila Prabhupada visited the golden temple at Amritsa, then when he was leaving, he was asked to sign the visitor's book. So, one of the entries, the name, address, and one of the entries is religion. So, Srila Prabhupada wrote, Krishnaite. <laughs> People think, what is your religion? Are you a Muslim, a Christian, a Hindu, or what are you? But Srila Prabhupada would always explain that they, it's not that <coughs> your dharma or my dharma can be different. Because dharma means the intrinsic nature. Just like you can't say there's Muslim sugar or Hindu sugar. Is it possible to say? Sugar has its own nature. Sugar is sweet. 
So because sugar is produced in Hindustan, you can't say it's Hindu sugar. Or I don't know if sugar is produced here. They could maybe make it from... They can make date syrup, right? They make that here? Probably. So, but... Well, you could say it's Kuwaiti date syrup. But you can't say it's Muslim date syrup. Even though most of the people here are Muslim. Because it has its own nature, which is not... You can't impose this upadhi, this designation. The, the designation Hindu, Muslim, Christian, we use this to apply to worldly divisions. But dharma is independent of Hinduism. You may say dharma. Well, that's something described in Hindu Shastra. But there's no such thing as Hindu. Even the word Hindu doesn't... There's no such word in the Shastra. We have the term Ved. Ved means knowledge. Knowledge is not Hindu or Christian or Muslim or Buddhist or atheist. Two plus two equals four is an accepted fact. So, what is stated in Shastra, it's not something that simply that people are supposed to believe. Srila Prabhupada always presented Krishna consciousness <coughs> scientific knowledge of the personality of Godhead. What do we mean by scientific? That means it's systematically presented and uh, it is demonstrable. Science, at least they tell us, it rests on the principle of being demonstrable. Of course, there's a lot in, in physics which is just pure speculation and not demonstrable in any way whatsoever. <coughs> what they call physics. It's more like numerical speculation. But at the Vyavaharic level, or at, at, it is demonstrable. I mean... Srila Prabhupada was very critical of science in some ways, in, of, of the atheistic attitude common to many scientists. But at the same time, he said that bhakti is a science, in a manner of praising it. And we'll find this word often in Bhagavad Gita. Vigyana. Jnanam teham sa vigyanam idam vakshyam yasheshataha yajgyatva neha bhuyo nyaj gyata vyamma vashishyate. We'll find this Again and again we'll find this word vigyan in Bhagavad Gita. Now vigyan in modern Indian languages means science. What is meant by science in the in the modern way of thinking, there's no there's no actual term which fits with the uh, with the Sanskrit, with the with the way of thinking, because Science as we know it in the modern world has evolved from the, in the Western world, from the alchemy and then the enlightenment way of thinking. So it's evolved as a discipline or a, a series of disciplines which uh, is largely anti-theistic in its outlook. Generally, people think of science as being something that you can... It's demonstrable. And religion is just a belief. It's just something you believe. I mean, there are, there are scientists who profess to believe in God. And they'll say things like, well, I believe in God, but as a scientist, I can't accept this, 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 and this in the scripture. So they differentiate between religion. They say religion is a kind of belief and science is something demonstrable or something logical. But Srila Prabhupada would always say that Krishna consciousness is a science. It's not just a matter of belief. Now in Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna, he talks about vijnana, but he also talks about faith, that faith is required. Ashradhana purusha dharma syasya parantapa aprapya maang nevartante mrityu samsara vartante 
Lord Krishna says that those who are not faithful, they fall away. They don't remain on this path. They come back to samsara. They come back to birth and death. So what's the link between faith and science? Well, even science is based on faith at some level. Everything's based on faith at some level. Just like, here's water. I just drunk it with faith that there's no cyanide in it. No one had put any poisonous item into it, apart from the producers, because the plastic bottle itself is carcinogenic, but not immediately. It's not going to immediately kill you, just slowly. So uh, we have faith. Well, you may say, well, that's not really faith. I mean, that's just obvious. But it is a kind of faith also, isn't it? When we walk on the road, we have faith that when we put our foot down, the the earth will support us. So faith is required at some level to start anything. Just like I was saying, two plus two equals four. Everyone accepts it, right? I mean, except you're, unless you're extremely obstinate and stubborn, you have to accept that two plus two equals four. What does that mean, two plus two equals four? Two is just a concept. There's no such thing as a number, actually. It's just, it's just a concept. But we, modern science wants to categorize everything into numbers. Everything should be described by numbers. But then the number itself, you can't really define what a number is. It's just a concept. So, but we have faith that a number represents something, although it's not really definable at all. It's abstract. When you say 2 plus 2 equals 4, then 2. It's an abstract which covers 2 apples plus 2 apples equals 4 apples. 2 cows plus 2 cows equals 4 cows. But 2 plus 2, just 2 in itself, it doesn't really mean anything. So, science is also based on some faith, but it's reasonable faith. I mean, it would be foolish to doubt everything. Some people say, well, we should doubt everything. But you can't even breathe if you doubt everything. If you have to test the air every time before you breathe in and breathe out, then you'll die before you can do that. Or if you have to test <coughs> test the water before you taste it, then but even if you want to test it, you have to have faith that the, the testing process works. You have to have faith in the testing process. So, at some point, you have to put your faith. Now, you could say that the difference between what is called science and what is called religion is that the level of faith in religion is at a much more abstract level. Just like... Uh, well, we believe that... Uh, something demonstrable, that uh, acids and alkalis interact to produce a salt and water. It's a, it's a very easily demonstrable thing. So that's very gross on the gross platform. But to say there is God, well, people say, well, you can't see God, so why should we believe in it? But then, in, why, why should we believe in God if we can't see? But then, anything in science, also in gross material science, anything subtle, you can't see it. You can't, you can't physically experience it. Just like a subatomic particle. Has anyone ever seen a subatomic particle? Is it possible to see? But why do we accept their existence? It's by anuman, by hypothesis. And it seems to work. Relativity theory is a theory. It's not 
demonstrable, but it's philosophically acceptable and it seems to work. We all accept that Einstein was a brilliant scientist, don't we? Would anyone disagree with that? Well, his friend from Denmark, what was his name? Niels Bohr, he was, well, he would also accept that he's a brilliant scientist. But none of us understand anything that he says, probably, isn't it? But we just accept that he's somewhere up there on a level much higher than us, and we accept that what he says is very good. Because others say, and because his theories are accepted by other scientists. So that's faith. We all have faith that Einstein was a great scientist. Though we, have, we, can all say, we all know E equals MC squared. We can all say that. But we don't understand it. So, mostly we, we accept on faith. Even to study science, you have to accept on faith what the teachers or the professors teach you. If you want to question at every moment, you can't learn, isn't it? You have to accept that the, the professor is teaching us something, I don't understand it, but if I patiently listen to him, then I will be able to understand it. I many times, I, I, I remember when, when I was first in the mathematics class and the teacher first put on the board, Calculus calculation, I thought, Ooh, what's that? It looks really strange. It looks really complicated. But, you know, with a little explaining, then we could understand. But if I had a challenge, if I said, well, you know, you, did, you put something on the board like that, well, I can do something else. And you say this represents that, well, I don't believe it. Prove it. Now, how is he going to prove unless you submissively, unless you have faith, unless you have faith that he has something valuable to present, you can't begin to understand it. If, you, if at the beginning you accept that what he is presenting is something of value, something that can be understood, and therefore you submissively listen to him and you try to understand, then he can show you how to perform calculus operations and how they may be practically used. Later on, you learn how they can be practically used in so many engineering and so many different things. But if at the beginning you say, well, I, I don't believe all this, it's just... It's, anyone can make a sign on the board. I can also squiggle something on the board. What's, what's so great about that? Then you can't learn. So in the same way, tadvidhi pranipatena pariprasnena sevaya upadekshanti te jnanam jnaninas tatvadarsana. Entry into the highest level of subtle understanding begins with faith and submissive hearing and also service. In the modern educational institutions, there's no idea of service to the teacher. It's simply, you pay, you pay for education, he's paid. So there cannot be divine revelation like this. You can teach, but there's no exchange of affection. There might be between the teacher and the student, but it's not considered important. Whereas in the traditional system of learning, the blessings of the teacher is considered essential, not only for spiritual subjects. We see that Arjun was the dearest disciple of Drona Acharya for learning how to fight and kill people. And Arjuna thought that it's by the blessings of Drona Acharya that I can, without his blessings, we cannot succeed. Actually, when Yudhishthira Maharaj, before the battle was about to begin, he went and he sought blessings from his gurus. Before you start any major endeavor, you should seek blessings from your gurus. So he sought blessings from Drona, who was on the other party. 
that maybe have blessings to fight with you. You you bless me to be victorious. You see, when you're fighting, when you're Shastra Guru, means your weapons guru, you're going to go in a fight. So first you take blessings from the Guru that I may be victorious. So Drona blessed him and said, you'll be victorious, means you'll defeat us. He said, if you hadn't come for blessings, you would have been destroyed. But because you asked for blessings, you'll be victorious. His duty as Guru is to bless. You fight me and kill me, all right, blessing. So, some initial faith is required. And with that we can proceed. And we can understand that there is a, rea- there is a reality beyond the uh, gross matter and even beyond subtle matter. That is spirit. Now we may say, well, science is demonstrable, but of course there are many things in modern scientific theory which are not demonstrated, they're just theories. And uh, just like people take it for granted that, uh, or Big Bang Theory, anyone like to demonstrate it? Make a Big Bang and make a new universe? Is it demonstrable? You can say, you can say that we extrapolate it from what we presently see, but it's it's educated guesswork at best. You can't always understand the cause from the effect. Just like if you see a big banyan tree, who would ever guess it comes from a little seed? If you see a butterfly, would you ever guess it came from a caterpillar? If you did scientific research without ever seeing a caterpillar transform into a butterfly, You'd never guess that it came... And if you said that it came from a... But, a butterfly came from a caterpillar, people would say you're crazy. So, much of what goes on in the name of science is guesswork. And people accept it on faith. But they say to believe in God is just sentimentalism. But it's actually very intelligent. Or rather, we can. It's not very. Actually, it's not very intelligent to believe in God, but it's just damn stupid not to believe in God. If you say that, if we t- take God as as the minimum definition, He's a lot more than the Creator of the universe. But if we take that as the minimum definition of God, then to say that everything that we can perceive has come into being by chance, without anyone to order that. That is the most stupid idea. Look at this. Now, would anyone believe that this could come into being by chance? Is it possible? Even if you know, trillions of big bangs, little bangs, medium bangs, 60% bangs, this could never come into being by chance. It's something... Simple, right? Everyone can see it. It's a simple tumbler. But how much human energy and intelligence and endeavor has gone into this? First of all, to develop the kind of steel that uh, it's pretty, it's not very heavy, but it's pretty solid. And the steel and the design that makes it like that, that makes it stainless, unless you soak salty water in it or something, it's not likely to get stained very soon. So, how to ex- extract the iron, from the, find the iron ore, extract it, smelt it, and then give exactly the right admixture of carbon so that it becomes stainless steel, and make it with this des- just with this design. It looks a little attractive even. There's so many considerations, not just the technical, it's also the economic consideration. Is it economic? Are we going to make a profit by doing this? There are so many considerations. And then this was probably bought in India and sold in a shop in Kuwait. And then there's, you know, import laws and 
I mean, if you wanted to, you could spend your whole life writing about all the different parameters and considerations that go into making one steel tumbler, which is something which is just very simple. And if we say that the whole universe, or even one cell within our body is practically unlimitedly times more complex than this, and all the cells interact with each other, within the body, in various ways which we still are a long way from fully understanding. And then all the different bodies interact with each other on different planets, and then all the planets, they also interact with each other. According to Vedic understand, the, the moon nourishes the vegetable. Dhamma vishya cha bhutani dharyami Lord Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita. He is the moon. Kushnami cho shadhi sarva somo bhutva prasatmaka. Krishna is the moon which gives life to the vegetable. The influence of the moon is there. There's the English word is there, lunatic. It means a madman because the, the moon affects the mind. So the whole universe is so complex. It's, what would we say? It's ten raised to the power of infinity, practically. It's infinitely more complex than this. And no one except, a, and unless someone was extremely stubborn and obstinate, they could not argue that this could ever come into being by chance, under any circumstances. And then how are they going to say the whole universe came into being by chance? If intelligence and endeavor is required to produce this, then is not intelligence required to make something which is infinitely more complex and to maintain it? So, like I said, it's not particularly, we can't say it's very intelligent to believe in God, is not necessarily a sign of great intelligence, but it is a sign of tremendous non-intelligence not to believe in God. And this is what Prabhupada was banging on the scientists, that you say you're scientists and you're presenting knowledge, but at the same time, if you say there's no God, it's most unscientific. You're doing a disservice to not only to God, but to humanity and to yourself and to science. Science would be a lot better if they simply recognized that there is an ultimate source of everything. And actually, science, that would be its perfection. Actually, science means the pursuit of knowledge, to try to find out the truth of how things are. But the, the initial a limitation that mundane science sets on itself, that we can only believe that which we can observe. We cannot, we cannot accept anything else. That, in, from the very beginning, is extremely irrational. If we can only accept as reality that which is observable, not just observable, that which we can extrapolate from that which is observable, that is an extremely unscientific proposition. In the, name, in the name of science, from the very beginning, it's unscientific because they say, well, we only accept what is observable, but it is reasonable to presume that, there's all, that there may be so many spheres of experience which are beyond our ability to experience. Why should we presume that all of reality is within the scope of our experience when we just live on this tiny little planet with our very limited intelligence. And we have the four defects, Brahmad, Vipralipsa, Karanapata. We can't we're illusioned, we have imperfect senses, we have the cheating propensity, and we make mistakes. And we presume that we, we will speak about reality. But it's much more reasonable to accept that well we don't really know very much what's going on at all. And all the really great geniuses, they all accept that. 
that we don't really know what's going on very much. And those who are really intelligent, they, under, they understand that there should be levels of reality beyond that which we can just easily observe. That's called Shastra. People, that's why I say it's a Shastra. It's not just some, it's not a Hindu book. Ved means knowledge. It's not Hindu knowledge or we can't say the Bible is Christian knowledge. Or that may be. There, may, there are sectarian religions, but Srimad Bhagavatam is concerned with truth, not with what we call religion. Vedyam Vastavam Atravastu stated in the beginning of Bhagavatam, that the Srimad Bhagavatam hits on the subject of the absolute truth. We don't find in Bhagavatam, Vyasadeva says, now I'm going to give you Hindu religion. But he says, Vedyam Vastam Atra Vastushu. Mahamuni Krite, Vyasadeva compiled this, giving what is the actual truth, what is reality. Now, Srila Prabhupada gave this example that what is Shastra? I was there in London when one reporter asked Srila Prabhupada, Prabhupada was having an interview. It's there in Science of Self-Realization with Mike Robinson. So Mike Robinson, he asked a question of Prabhupada and Prabhupada in reply, he had one of his disciples read a verse from Bhagavad Gita in Sanskrit. Najayate mriyate vakada chinnayam bhutva bhavita bhana bhuya. Ajo nityang shashvato yang purano nahanyate hanyamane shalere. So then uh, Mike Robinson, he kind of changed the subject a bit and said, Oh, you're quoting that Sanskrit, you're quoting from scripture. So what is the scripture? And Srila Prabhupada gave an example. Srila Prabhupada was speaking into a microphone. And he said, just like this microphone, we'll pretend this is a microphone. He said, when you get this, there's also, when you purchase this, there's a manual which comes with it, isn't there? Which tells you what it's for, how to use it, all these things. So he said, just like the manufacturer of a microphone gives a manual, so the manufacturer of the universe gives a manual, and that's called scripture which tells you what is the universe and how to use it and get the best benefit out of it. So it is reasonable to consider that there, that there is a creator of the universe and he creates it for a certain purpose. As Einstein famously said, I don't believe that God is playing dice with the universe. The idea that everything simply came into chance. It's just God on a whim created the universe just for fun. Well, that's an extrapolation. Anyway, there's a story told about Newton. I don't know if it's true or not, but we heard it in Iskon that, that Newton was uh, a theist. And he had a friend who was an atheist who believed that everything had come into being by chance. So one time his atheist scientist friend came and visited Newton, and in his study, he saw a model of the universe, a moving model of the universe, as it was understood at that time. And his friend was astonished. He said, oh, this is wonderful. It's a model of the universe. Maybe you crank it a bit, and then all you know the things all move. And This is really good. He said, who made that? He said, no one made it. What do you mean, no one made it? And no one made it, just, you know, it's just there, that's all. No, no, who made it? No one made it, it's just, you know, just there. He said, why are you speaking so unscientifically? You're supposed to be a scientist. And said, then Newton turned to him and said, well, why are you speaking so unscientifically? When you, think, you say the model of the universe can't exist without a maker, well, what about the universe itself? There's only a copy, a, a a, a rough copy of the real thing. So, if we, it's only reasonable to when we see so much order that it's set up by a person 
with a purpose. Just like sometimes they have inventors' fairs. Different people invent different things and they exhibit them at some fair. So if you go to the inventors' fair and the inventor is standing there very proudly with his machine and he demonstrates, you see, push a button and this pulley starts to move and this light blinks and there's a noise, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. And, you know, it does so many different things. You say, wow, that looks very interesting. What does it do? You know, it doesn't do anything. It's just a machine, that's all. You, you hit the button and the pulley moves and the light blinks and it makes a noise. Now, what's the use? It's, it's stupid to make such a machine. It should have a purpose. It should do something. You can get an electric toothbrush. You see, it has a purpose. If you're In the morning, you're feeling too tired to to move your hand up and down. Well, actually, they say that they make it so that it gets the correct motion because people mostly brush the wrong way. So it has a purpose, an electric toothbrush, you see. It's invented with a purpose so you can brush your teeth properly. Or So it has everything has a purpose. If you make something, it should be with a purpose. Otherwise, it's just stupid. So if the universe is created, which it's only reasonable to presume that it's created, there should be a purpose also. And the manual, which describes what the purpose is, is Shastra. So I'm just saying all this to show that it's not unreasonable to accept that there is... God and the scriptures have something meaningful to say to us. It's just that it's on a it's on a level which is more subtle than that of gross science. You know, anyone can you know, get a piece of magnesium and light it up and, and say, There you go, you see? Yeah. Magnesium oxide, ashes. So it's it's demonstrable easily. But it's not demonstrable that God creates the universe because you can't say, hey God, come and show us, Dem- show us, make a, make a universe and show us. Then we'll believe in you. That's unreasonable. But it is reasonable to accept that there is a creator who has created the universe with a purpose. Now, it may be difficult to understand what the purpose is, because if we think that God should be all good, then why is there suffering within the world? And that becomes a philosophical question. But if you see the Shastra, it gives the answer. Actually, you won't find in the in the Christian religion, for instance, that I was raised in, there's no good answer. I, at an early age, for a brief period, became an atheist, because I thought that what I'm being taught about God is it's just doesn't make any sense. They say that we're all su- all the suffering in the world is caused because my great 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 few times back grandfather called Adam ate an apple. Doesn't seem to make sense. You know, he ate an apple, so you know, therefore I get measles and cough and cold and there are wars and you know, it doesn't really seem to make any sense. And they also say, if you don't believe in Jesus, then the all-merciful, all-loving God burns you in hell forever. So I thought, wow, that doesn't seem to, you know, it doesn't seem to be really a very nice God. So due to the unscientific presentation, uh, I actually became an atheist for some time. But then I, after some time I thought, well, actually there should be a God, but they don't know who he is. And then later on, Srila Prabhupada scientifically described the nature of God. So this is something very exciting, actually, that in a wor- the, the world at the present time is very much based on modern science, both in terms of uh, its gross manifestation, we're able to fly from here to there, and watch TV and but also in the whole way of thinking of the world is very much influenced by uh, scientifically or pseudo-scientifically influenced atheism. 
But at the same time, people are unhappy and discontent, and the bad effects of science are being seen also. That science has not produced the Shangri La or the utopia that people were expecting. People were expecting that science will make a much better world for us. The green revolution in Punjab solved India's food problem. But now it's not working anymore. Because they have to put so much fertilizer, the soil is finished. They have to put so much fertilizer and, and from the pesticides all the farmers are getting cancer. And it seemed to be good for a short time, but in the long term it's producing a disaster actually. Because the, the, the scientific advancement, we, it, they have been implemented in the world in a very short term way of thinking. Just like nuclear power, it's great, you know, you get all this nuclear power, cheap energy, but then you've got to contend with nuclear waste for like, you know, billions of years. It's, it's, it's a problem which is not going to go away. You, get, you can turn on, you know, the electric lights for a few years and then for, for the whole history of the universe practically, you, you have serious pollution. What to speak of the threat of any time someone can just decide that, well, we don't like these people, so let's burn them up in a nuclear fire. It's very dangerous. So the world is uh, very confused and actually Krishna Consciousness has got the perfect answer, scientific. Because it presents knowledge of God, which is not, it's based on faith, but not blind faith. Very reasonably presents that these are the characteristics of God, how he is to be understood. And it's demonstrable. It's not simply blind faith, but it's demonstrable that anyone who takes to Krishna consciousness, their character improves. And pratyakshavagamang dharmyam susukam kartam avyayam. One can begin to directly experience God. And it's very joyfully performed. So, Srila Prabhupada always wanted to present Krishna consciousness as a science. He said, well, if you present it as a religion, people say, well... I already have my Muslim religion or Christian religion and or it's just your faith. But if we present it scientifically, then it crosses all sectarian boundaries. Prabhupada would say this is non-sectarian. We say, yeah, well, it's just another religion. But it's the science of understanding Atma and Paramatma. There's knowledge of God. It's not just that, well, there's God. Who's that? Well, the, and you just say God and that's it. You don't, you don't know anything. Or, or, or even in some religions they say you, you shouldn't even try to understand. God's so great. Don't try to understand. But Krishna Consciousness presents true love of God. That the ultimate principle of reality is love. But that love means selfless. And the relationship between God and the, the living beings is not one of some vengeful person who throws you into hell forever if you don't do what he says, but one who actually loves you. And that love is to the superlative degree. And here we come back to Sri Sri Gornitai, Sri Sri Krishna Balaram, and Sri Sri Radha Shamsundra. The ultimate object of science, although the scientists don't know it, is to offer a tulsi leaf to Radharani in her hand and she will place that at the lotus feet of Krishna. You may think, well, that doesn't sound very scientific. Well, it is. But the scientists, they're stuck on a lower platform. They don't know that the ultimate science is one of love. It's what makes the universe run on. You can't find it with numbers.
but it's Radha's love for Krishna. And from that, all love of Krishna, of all living beings, expands. That is the ultimate principle by which everything runs on. What is the meaning of life? What is the purpose of life? That is love. And the proper object of love is Krishna. And the superlative lover of Krishna is Radha. So this is Vrindavan. But that... Well, that has to be accepted on faith. But the, the, the basic principles of Bhagavatam, there are many things which are scientifically demonstrable. But there are certain things which we have to accept simply because Shastra has given it and the Acharyas have given it. And we accept that they're on a level, we can just accept that what they know what they're talking about. Just like we all, we'll all praise Einstein, we don't know... We can't understand what he says, but we accept it because, well, Einstein said it. So, he understands. We don't understand. So, in the same way, we can accept what the Acharyas present. And the principle is appealing. The principle is appealing to the soul, that of pure love, selfless love. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu teaches Nadhanam Najanam Nasundarim Kavitam Vaja Gadisha Kami and Ramad Janani Janishri Kavatan Pira Hanti Kitra. This love that I don't I'm not asking you for anything for myself, but I simply want to serve you selflessly. So this is appealing. Yes, this this is real, this is a, an exalted principle. This appeals to the to the soul, to the purified soul. This is not religion. Religion means going to God and praying, yes, dhanam, yes, janam, yes, sundarim, give me, dhanam dehi, yasham dehi, rupavati bharya dehi, give me, give me, give me, all these things. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu teaches the dharma of the soul, which is simply to love Krishna because he is lovable. Now, everyone cannot become Einstein. Within generations, there may be someone on the level of Einstein in the scientific world. But everyone can become more than Einstein on the spiritual sphere by simply with love offering a tulsi leaf at the lotus feet of Krishna. <coughs> Something that Einstein, although he progressed so high in one sphere, but he, was, he didn't have any direction in the really important sphere, the highest science of Bhagavad Dharma. So to do that, one doesn't require to be a big scientist or a big philosopher, although we're discussing philosophy here, as our Acharyas have done, as is necessary, because bhakti is not merely sentiment. Bhakti is to be understood with the intelligence also. Bhagavan Krishna spoke to Arjuna. He didn't just say, Hey, come on, Arjuna, come on, Arjuna, just talk, just get in there, fight. You know, it wasn't like some kind of sports, rah, rah, rah. But he, he, they discussed philosophy. So Bhagavatam presents philosophically. The science of God. Bhagavad Tattva Vigyanam Mukta Sangasya Jayate. By understanding the science of God, we become free from materialist association. So we should discuss this. Bhakti is not just sentiment. We find I was talking that Prabhupada, I was he would always sing this Jai Radha Madhava, which is a complete picture of Vrindavan. But then Prabhupada would inevitably, his classes, he would discuss philosophy. Not speculative philosophy, but the philosophy of the science of God. So seeing this picture of Vrindavan, in which is for, you can say, practical purposes stated to be in UP, but not really in UP at all. 
and seeing our so-called scientists sitting underneath it. I'm not insulting you because you yourself say like that, understanding yourself to be a true scientist, a spiritual scientist. Hmm. Yeah. But actually, a devotee is a scientist, a spiritual scientist. So, so So then I had some inspiration to talk of the spiritual science of approaching Krishna in Vrindavan. And in his introduction to Srimad Bhagavatam, Srila Prabhupada explains how the, uh, the, the understanding of God and the absolute truth, these are synthesized in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Because the absolute truth is God. So in the same way, Srila Prabhupada, he set up the Bhaktivedanta Institute to show the proper synthesis of science and religion. And the proper synthesis is when we understand that there actually is no difference. That Krishna consciousness is in one sense religion, and in another sense science, and in another sense transcends all concepts of mundane religion and mundane science. It is the highest knowledge and it is the dharma for the soul. So it crosses, Krishna consciousness crosses all sectarian designations of religion and science and presents, this is reality. So it's a very good opportunity to present the present time is a very good opportunity to present Krishna consciousness to the people of the world if we can <coughs> present it in a non-sectarian manner. So here are some thoughts. I didn't prepare anything to say. When I, can, I don't usually prepare anything to say, just when I come to a place, then whatever. However, Krishna inspires me to speak. Yesterday, in Bahrain, at the beginning of the lecture, I saw everyone was just sitting on the floor without any mat. So I told them, better you sit on a mat, it's better for health. And then I was saying, in actually in Vedic culture, you should sit on a mat to do puja. So maybe one reason is for health also, because to sit on the cold floor is not good. Then I just started speaking about Vedic culture. I didn't, I didn't have any idea what I was going to speak on. But if we start speaking, then we can relate everything to Krishna. <coughs> because there, everything is related to Krishna. Our talk should come. Srila Prabhupada, you can see these conversations of Srila Prabhupada. Many of them are published, the transcripts. Although there are many, many other conversations which were not recorded or transcribed. And Prabhupada spoke about so many things. He, one thing he often spoke about was the fairly recent history of India. He would speak about the culture of India as he had seen it. He, one time he was talking about the comparing the beautiful women of France with the beautiful women of Bengal. Srila Prabhupada would speak and he would see different things. And he would, he would discuss this world and how we can see everything. He would bring everything to Krishna. It's not that we have to go and lock ourselves in a cave and chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. I don't see anything in this world. But rather seeing everything in this world and seeing Krishna. Yomam Parshati Sarvacha Sarvang Chamai Parshati Tasyahang Napranasham Sachame Napranasati. Prabhupada was the personification of seeing Krishna everywhere and everything in Krishna. And Krishna says, for such a devotee, he is never lost to me, nor am I ever lost to him. So, Krishna consciousness means that we, we, we relate everything to Krishna. The other day, I, I came into a room, the, the fan was gone. I asked the children, what's the Hindi name for fan? 
Tanka, Tanka. So that's derived from Sanskrit. Which word? What's it in Bengali? No, there's no Bengalis here. The Bengali word is Pakka, which is the Bengali pronunciation of Paksha. So Paksha means, I asked the children, they all said bird. Wrong. Pakshi is bird. And Paksha means? Side. Side. Side is one meaning, but in this context? Huh? That's another meaning. <laughs> but it's another meaning of fifteen days. Yeah, it's not exactly a fortnight. Yeah, it's fifteen. It's half a lunar month. Well, it means it means a wing or a feather. So a pakshi is one who has a paksha. So then, when you see panka, paksha, then you think. Pakka. Pankha is derived from Sanskrit. Paksha. So then you have to think, Pahavatang samasitam buddha sundaranga. You think of feather, you think of peacock feather in Krishna's head. So from you seeing the fan, you can come to Krishna's peacock feather. And we can do that with everything. Take anything. I'm seeing the glasses. So glasses means that we can't see properly. We need some help. Then we can think of Ajnana Timirandhasya, Jnananjana Shalakaya, Chakshur Militam Yena Tasmai Sri Guru Vedana. Srila Prabhupada, once he was walking, and he was talking like this. He would talk with his disciples, have philosophical fighting with them. He would make them take the position of atheists. So Srila Prabhupada was one time he was saying he was saying that well there is God and they were taking the atheistic position. And they said, Well well we cannot see God. And Prabhupada said, But I can see. You cannot see. You have a cataract. You come to me. I will perform an operation. So we all have the ability to see God, but it is covered by our rascaldom. This is a word which Prabhupada used very often. Because we are rascals. Why? People will ask, well, if there is God, why don't we see Him? The answer is, Namang duskrishino mudha prapadyante naradhama maya paritagya maya aparitagya. See, I'm very intelligent, I'm a scholar, I'm a scientist, I'm a philosopher, but you are maya aparitagya. Your knowledge is covered by illusion, or maybe you're just simply asuram bhavamashrita. One of these four categories. Why is it big, big, intelligent? Scientists, very intelligent. We're not saying they're not intelligent. You have to be intelligent to make a nuclear bomb or even to make a little tumbler like this. It requires a lot of intelligence. I couldn't make it. You give me iron ore and all the required ingredients and even if you made the factory and brought me to the factory, I still wouldn't know how to make it. I mean, I could learn, probably. But it does require a lot of intelligence and training. So we're not saying that scientists aren't intelligent. We're just saying they're rascals, that's all. If they don't accept Krishna, or if they don't accept the existence of God. And we're not just saying it because we don't like scientists, but we're saying it because Krishna says it. So the intelligence should become purified by understanding Bhagavat Tattva Vigyana. So I'm suggesting this to all of you. I know that Indian people in general are very much enamored by science. If you say Sri Bhagavan Uvacha, they'll say, well, it's just, that's someone's belief. But if you say Sri Scientist Uvacha, it's just, oh. <laughs> so the scientists say, yeah, oh, oh, yeah. Oh. And we have great respect for the scientists. So. 
we should understand Krishna consciousness is not just a faith, but it is a science. It's the highest science. So what are you all doing here? You're all, you have professional scientists or teacher of science, theoretical scientists, I suppose. What are you doing? Air conditioning mechanic. Well, we can remember Krishna by being an air conditioning mechanic. How can you remember Krishna? You can remember Prabhupada's example that the expert electrician he can make from the electric energy heat or cooling, both. So in the same way, Krishna's energies, to Krishna, all the energies are spiritual. They're all just his energies. But he makes spiritual energy and material energy. So everything you can remember Krishna. What are you doing? Purchasing. Not selling also? (laughs) Purchasing for a company. Ladies, you're all housewives, is it? Housewives. Yeah, very good. I always recommend. (laughs) Sometimes I become unpopular. But I recommend housewives have to look after the children. Anyway, I gave a big talk on this in Bahrain just yesterday. And it was appreciated because actually... It's best that the women look after the children because children are important and they need to have a mother, not a virtual mother, a real mother. All right, so what are you all doing? I see. They fooled you. They fooled you. They gave you one day, they gave you a designation with a lower status and lower pay. No, they gave me a. As far as the work is concerned, ah. uh, the signature was okay. Is it okay? All right. And, uh, I, and, uh, and if I the same... All right. Sometimes they do that. They give you a lower post, but then they give you work on a higher level at a lower pay. <laughs> anyway, it didn't happen with you. There's a lot of cheating going on in this part of the world, especially in the labor department. There it's it's... Just exploitation. Yourself? Sometimes it's hardware and networking. Hardware and networking. You always have plenty of work because it's networking. They never seem to really get it together. It seems it's always problems, right? (laughs) Well, that saying is there that, you know, to err is human, but if you really want to goof things up, get a computer. So, computer means there's all... Computer engineers and maintenance men always have work because computers are no doubt a brilliant invention, but, you know, they're always going wrong. And because they're quite complex, you need someone who's got some understanding of these things to work it out. <coughs> Yourself, sir? Yeah, I'm a mechanical engineer. Mechanical engineer. In which field? Welding is special, special for welding. Yourself? Yeah. Electrician, yeah? Pure an office work. Doing an office work. Electrical technician. Oh, Electrical right. technician. Electrical engineers. See, so most are, or many are in the, like the technical line. Yeah. Is it? Civil engineer. Civil engineer. <coughs> what are you doing? Building, is it? Construction? Yes. There's a lot of it going on in this part of the world. Tremendous. Dubai is wild, huh? It's just like growing double size every year. But it all depends on this artificial civilization. You know, in these countries, if for, if, you know, if for a few days they stop flying in food, then it'll be a disaster. If for some reason it's, it's broken down, all the supplies except oil 
and sand if you want sand. It's, uh, it's coming from outside. So it's really dependent on uh, in a very artificial way of life. The whole world is going on in a very artificial way. I'm from Britain, and even when I was a child, they, always, they imported more than 50% of their food. <coughs> then, who else is there? Basically, mechanical engineer. Mechanical engineer. Importer. Porter. Not an importer, a porter. <coughs> Carpenter. There's still work for carpenters. Still, not everything's made out of plastic. Then? In the cafe. In the cafe. Yourself? Office assistant. Officer's assistant, yeah. Then? Last ingestion molding operator. Oh, that was a long one. Can you say it a little slowly? Last ingestion molding operator. Right. Sounds Operate very operative. sounds very technical. Instrumentation. Instrumentation. Well, sounds difficult. So, whatever you're doing, please chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. and develop our love for the supreme scientist. And try to understand, read, read Srila Prabhupada's books. Please read Srila Prabhupada's books. Srila Prabhupada always emphasized this. Who's reading Prabhupada's books? Who's read all of Bhagavad Gita as it is, at least once? Please raise your hand. That's understood. Ladies? Oh, you should, you're not sure. <laughs> That means you read it without the purports. Please, please read Gita Bhagavatam. It's very important. When I was reciting these Gita shlokas, I see many of you, you know Gita shlokas. But you have to read the purport to understand it properly. That's essential. Prabhupada's purport. Prabhupada is presenting very clearly the science of Godhead so that even people like ourselves who are coming from the western countries and no background of this we can understand it alright, is there any question, comment, protest or any such thing please voice it now mm. Mm -hmm. Wasn't that in Bombay, the first one? Yeah, it was in Bombay. And this was... Uh, 86 Bombay. 76. 86. This is 96. Yeah. So there, in that conference, uh, all religious uh, scholars, religious leaders, uh -huh. attended. And also, all scientists also attended. Yeah. Five, six, noble arrays. Yeah, yeah. Conference. Yeah. So, yeah. One single dayas. So one, one, one single side? One single dayas. Uh -huh. Single platform. One side the scientists and the other side the religious leaders from all over the world. The unique uh, situation to discuss about the God existence or non existence. Yeah. So, Maharaj was speaking about the faith. In the context, I am telling this. There was a noble laureate who invented the laser beam. Now he is from Waterford, he is from Caltech University, USC. So he was, uh, when he was got the chance to speak, so he was telling about the faith. So faith is there in the science also very much. And he gives an example that we build so many things with the physics laws, with the faith that. The law is going to work tomorrow also. The faith. So many things we build with the physics and the technology, with the faith that the same law is going to work tomorrow also. Tomorrow in the future. Okay. So, it's not that there is no faith in science. Faith is very much there in the science. 
and the water with the noble are spoke like this on the grass, and thousands of people are there. So, Maharaj is also speaking about the faith, and not only the religion, the faith is required in the science also. And it's in the contest. Join. Anyone else? Anyone else like to say anything? Then we chant Hare Krishna some more. Sankirtan. Hmm? Well, I'm only here for half a day. It was supposed to be a whole day, but the flight got cancelled and I had to come on a later flight, so it became cut down. Unfortunately, it's, you know, it's the first time I came here and there's not enough time for the program. Anyway, yeah, we, have to, we have to take it like this. We have to take it like that, yeah. <clears throat> we can't expect that everything will go smoothly in this world. That's not possible. Especially when you're traveling around, there may be so many inconveniences. Srila Prabhupada himself was uh, once on landing in Bombay coming from Africa. They put him in quarantine for like two weeks or something. He was locked. Practically he was in prison because of the uh, yellow fever fear. All Prabhupada's problems. They wouldn't let him out. How to control our mind? Savai mana Krishna padara vindayo. Fix the mind on Krishna. Is there any more? I think there's not enough for everyone. Huh? Okay. So, ladies come first. <laughs> it's difficult to control the mind, but by... <laughs> Bhakti sadhana, fixing the mind on Krishna, gradually we can control the mind. Yeah. And then you have to practice. It takes time. Here. Practice. Well, I made one book, The Beginner's Guide to Krishna Consciousness. Did you see that? Acha, acha. So, I didn't bring because I was afraid the customs might catch me. You have it all. all right. So you follow that. Don't follow a little, follow more. <laughs> yeah, you please increase up to sixteen rounds. Yes, sir. You're doing you're doing sixteen rounds, very good. Yeah. They're mostly Telugu's, is it? Yeah. Mostly Telugu people here? All right, Tisco. <laughs> or Chapo, Hare Krishna. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought I recognized you. Yeah, regularly I'm going to Sikandrabad, Twin Cities. Anyone else? For many years I'm going. I traveled all over AP, all over Rayal Sima, Telangana. And, and the uh, coastly under. What do they call that in Telugu? Koti. Costa. 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 Costa.
I traveled. Probably I've been more in Andhra than any of you. <laughs> so many places I went. Chittor. Yeah, where? Chittor district. His name is Radha Krishna. Very good. Very good. Hare Krishna. This is Dakshina. All right, we'll accept it. Hare Krishna. Usually I like to give my books and CDs, but I didn't have because well, it's the first time I came here and I didn't know what it's like, so I was a little careful. I just brought two books. Actually, I kept one for you also. I kept one for uh, Tapan and one for you. It should be in there, but I hope he didn't keep it with him. And I brought one set of my CDs of lectures. I left it with him, and I asked if anyone wants, they can take copies from him. So you can get that, if you like. Yeah, the ladies didn't fully come yet. Hare Krishna. So you go on chanting, and you're reading Prabhupada's books? Some books for Prabhupada. You Some like to read in Telugu, is it? Yeah, yeah. Now we have all the uh, Bhagavatam is there. Actually, more books are not converted in Telugu. No, no, now the whole Bhagavatam is there. Whole Bhagavatam is there. Omar. This is a separate group. Went to Krishna consciousness about six months ago. So, Mata in our house, we have this happened in one week. Actually, we have planned uh, in our house. Uh, Program. It's, uh, it didn't make light. <laughs> so Bhagyam. Bhagyamu. Uh, Dur <laughs> What to do? <laughs> 